It is early days, but what are your expectations in terms of spikogen's protection against Omicron? So like uh, all vaccines, you know, Omicron's only been uh, around for the last, uh, you know, eight weeks or so. So we're still in the early stages of assessing the level of protection of our vaccine against Omicron. Um, so I can't give you a direct answer on that right now. Uh, I should be able to in the next few weeks. Uh, but, you know, we're not uh, basically gambling on our vaccine being more effective than all the other vaccines against Omicron. It would be great if it is, and as I say, we'll know that uh, very shortly. But, but as an insurance policy, essentially we're developing a vaccine specifically uh, targeting Omicron, which should then give very high levels uh, of protection. So that v vaccine is now developed and, and obviously we will be um, uh, taking that into clinical trials uh, in the in coming weeks and, and hopefully we'll be able to roll it out very rapidly if it looks like uh, we need to have an Omicron-specific vaccine. Due to their short-lasting action, Israel has recommended a fourth booster dose of mRNA vaccine. Do you expect spikogen to need a similar number of doses? Again, um, you know, we, we don't know uh, yet uh, how many uh, booster doses of, of spikogen you might need to get um, you know, long-lived protection uh, against COVID-19. Um, it would be fabulous uh, if we need less booster doses than, than Pfizer um, or, or the other uh, uh, vaccines out there. Uh, but even if we don't, the beauty is we don't, aren't seeing these serious adverse events that we know are occurring uh, with the adenoviral vector and mRNA vaccines. And of course, they happen every time you have one of those vaccines or you have a boost of that vaccine. Even if you haven't had the side effect in the previous shots, you run the same risks each time you have an additional booster shot. Um, so our vaccine, because we're not seeing that, means you could have three or four or five doses potentially if you had to, but you're not running this risk each time of getting a serious side effect. So we see that as the major benefit. As I say, we can't say at this point that you'll necessarily need less boosters. But what we can say is you shouldn't be running the gauntlet each time you have a booster of having a serious side effect. Your team at Vaccine have developed a novel COVID-19 vaccine, which you call COVAX-19, or Spikogen, that in October last year achieved emergency youth authorization overseas, making it the first synthetic full spike protein vaccine in the world to achieve this critical milestone. How is Spikogen different to the other COVID vaccines available around the world? So as I've explained, um, you know, we were the first uh, protein-based uh, uh, vaccine to get approval last year uh, on a glo global basis. Um, you know, the, the protein-based approach, I think, is, is the safest uh, a approach. It's clearly been shown to be highly effective. Uh, and uh, that really does distinguish it against the, some of the newer technologies where we're still learning uh, about their safety and effectiveness and, and, and we still don't know what the long term, uh, as I say, effects of those vaccines are going to be, whereas protein-based vaccines have been in use for decades and so that provides a lot of confidence about you know, both their short term but also their long term effects. You use insect cells as your protein factories rather than the more commonly used mammalian cells like HEC-293. What is the benefit of the insect cell system? So a lot of people are surprised to hear that we manufacture our protein in insect cells. We're not using whole insects. These are, are just cells um, that, that live in broth um, that were originally harvested um, from a moth. Um, so the advantage of that is um, that insects um, are, are very different to, to humans and, and so the types of viruses that affect insects don't infect uh, humans. So it's a very safe technology. You can't accidentally um, transmit a, a virus across um, into the product. Um, and it produces a very uh, high quality pro synthetic protein. Um, 
the, the HEC293 cells are a human embryonic kidney cell uh, that are used by other companies, including AstraZeneca, to manufacture their, uh, in their case, an adenoviral vector vaccine. Um, and, and one of the issues is be, being, in fact, also a, a, ki a human cell, um, if any viruses were to infect those human cells, they, they could actually then infect the people who, who receive that vaccine. So, so at least theoretically, there are potentially additional um, safety issues that could be around that, although, of course, the manufacturing is designed to, to try and prevent that happening. The other issue, of course, is some people do have a religious objection uh, because of the way in which the hex cells were originally derived um, from a human fetus. Uh, obviously, a lot of people do have uh, quite strong religious objections to use of vaccines that have been produced using those cells. Obviously, they wouldn't have the same objection to a vaccine that's produced in uh, insect cells. We have heard a lot of discussion about vaccine ingredients and their significance and potential contributions to vaccine effectiveness. You use a natural plant sugar called inulin in your vaccine that comes from chicory root. Can you tell us why you add this and what it does? So this really goes back to, to the foundations of vaccine 20 years ago because we, we actually founded the company based on this discovery that this natural plant sugar from chicory, um, when made into a particular um, shape, uh, and added to a vaccine dramatically increases the effectiveness of the vaccine, very much like a turbocharger when you bolt it onto an engine increases the power. Um, so the beauty of, of using a plant sugar um, as a what we call a vaccine adjuvant or turbocharger is that we were able to replace the aluminium uh, salts which were previously used as adjuvants in, in many of these vaccines um, and, and again, um, sugars are, are much more natural components in, in the body um, and are broken down and metabolised. And so not only was it beneficial because it was such a wonderful uh, turbocharger for the vaccines, but we were doing this in, you know, using a very natural, um, very gentle uh, plant sugar. Um, so, so the benefits are twofold, both in terms of potentially safety, um, and tolerability, but also in terms of we get a very, very effective vaccine using this ingredient. Another component of your vaccine is a synthetic sugar-like molecule called oleonucleotide, made up of nucleic acids. Can you tell us why you add this and what it does? So this is a second component we've been adding more recently to um, our, uh, you know, inulin plant sugar component. Um, so an oligonucleotide is, is similar in a way to DNA, even though it, it's not DNA, but DNA itself is, is a whole lot of sugars linked together in a chain. Um, and so using this short um, piece of, of basically a short chain of, of sugars, we're able to stimulate a human receptor uh, called toll-like receptor 9. So this is a, a receptor on, on our immune cells uh, that alerts them to, to activate an immune response. And we found by adding a very small amount of this second component called an oligonucleotide that's made synthetically, um, that we could even further enhance um, the, the effectiveness of the vaccine. So this is a bit like putting an intercooler with a turbocharger for anyone who knows about car engines, uh, you can increase the power even further by adding those two components together. And similarly in the vaccine, we're adding the oligonucleotide uh, to the inulin sugar to even further enhance the effectiveness of the vaccine. What other components, if any, are in your vaccine? So really there's not a lot in our vaccines, which is, is I guess, uh, makes it um, you know, uh, attractive to people. So we have the, the synthetic purified protein from the insect cells. Uh, we have the plant sugar, we have the synthetic oligonucleotide. Um, we have a little bit of salt water, um, you know, which is just natural salt. And then we have a small amount of uh, a component uh, called tween 80, 
uh, which, which is, is basically a stabilising agent um, that stops the synthetic protein sticking to the glass of the vaccine vial, uh, which would re re result in us losing um, some of our vaccine because it's stuck onto the glass. And so the tween 80 stops that uh, happening and helps stabilise the vaccine. We have heard a lot about the benefits of COVID vaccines reducing infection and particularly serious disease and hospitalisation in the vaccinated individual. What about the possibility of a COVID vaccine to block virus transmission? So this is a great question because I think for the last two years people have been assuming based on um, you know, what's been marketed to them that the existing vaccines actually will prevent viral transmission when in fact the evidence suggests that's not the case. Um, and as we've seen, particularly with uh, variants like Omicron, uh, the vast majority of people who are getting infections are vaccinated people, and they're getting those infections from other vaccinated people. We know that because 90% of people are vaccinated, uh, and yet we're still getting these major waves of disease in those vaccinated people. So the current vaccines are not preventing transmission of Omicron. Um, now, the beauty is that when we tested our vaccine in animal models where we specifically looked at whether a vaccinated animal that had received our vaccine could transmit the virus to a, a non-vaccinated animal put in the same cage, we were able to actually show that we could our vaccine blocked the transmission um, so that the vaccinated animals were no longer transmitting the virus uh, to the naive animal. So although that's in, in an animal model, it's, it's still to this day, I think, the best uh, evidence of a vaccine that does have the potential to block transmission. Obviously, that's something that we'll be looking at uh, now that we have a large number of people vaccinated with our vaccine to see if that holds true uh, in humans. But as I say, we do have the strongest data to date that our vaccine may be able to actually reduce or block um, transmission.